thank you dr vadwa for a comprehensive view uh, related to prostate and in as a whole of voiding of male voiding i think it was very uh, complete i from our side dr bandari uh, hello sir would you like to add something then we can i discuss. think i i'll butt in i think if you have anything please add go ahead and then uh, okay i will definitely add after uh, you answer the questions which we have in question box yeah yeah no i i before that i have some myths uh, like uh, which commonly yeah, please people... go ahead please go ahead yeah yeah, yeah. so my first uh, myth is like uh, many individual came and uh, come in opd and they just say that my prostate is this much size so what is the relevance of the size in terms of the disease development or the symptoms development well as i said size um, is not the only criteria size does matter a larger prostate is likely to run into trouble but then size is also um, genetics so if somebody is 6 foot tall whose father was 6 foot tall and somebody else who may be 5 feet tall so it's not the that's the the configuration of that or the gene pool of that particular individual the size itself it is not the indication of a surgery it's always the symptoms or the botheration which would actually be the indication for treatment forget surgery even treatment so just having a large prostate does not equate to having a problem we all have enough uh, people whom we see who who are found to have a large prostate and are not bothered by it there is no reason for us to bother them or them to be bothered by it however they must be mindful of this of the of the uh, of this that they could develop symptoms earlier than the rest of their peers okay thank you so uh, when a patient uh, have uh, have the urinary trouble which is most likely to be secondary to a prostate in especially in older age group then whom they should see which uh, doctor they should consult well the urologist urologist would be the correct person um or at least initially by a, a physician who would who would hopefully be able to gauge the problem and then redirect the patient to the appropriate urologist to as i said the symptoms may be not only due to the prostate there are so many other symptoms so many other problems diseases which will mimic the prostate symptoms will have similar symptoms and therefore it is important to differentiate differentiate as to what is the real cause so that it doesn't go uh, un uh, doesn't get missed and of course uh, prostate cancer should be screened in the aging in the in the males uh, so that uh, it doesn't get missed uh, rightly said because the uh, early prostate cancer so symptoms are not different from the benign counterpart so they must be evaluated uh, thoroughly and then okay so next question is as you said that there are various way to deal with the benign enlargement of the prostate so uh, what criteria you suggest that by which we can decide that this patient uh, need only lifestyle modification uh, or without medicine we can manage or particular patient need med certain medications or few patient already or you already mentioned that uh, these set of the patient required surgery so that we know so how to differentiate which patient need only conservative management that is the lifestyle modification so i think that largely gets dictated by what the what the patient feels and what the patient experiences so if there are no absolute indications to doing surgery the patient decides how bothered he or she he is and thereby whether they need to be in a more wait and watch policy or whether some medication needs to be tried so it's that's why the symptom score is important and that's why the ips score is important uh, because it helps the patient uh, decide as to whether or not they would need to go on to medication or uh, so this their botheration index i think is extremely important while treating these patients because every male who walks in above the age of 50 in the opd is going to have a prostate that doesn't mean he necessarily needs treatment for it okay thank you uh, so now one thing is clear that those who have larger size they need addition addition of the uh, deuteroid or the fenesteroid 
and this drug decreases the size of the prostate so it is kind of androgen manipulation and this have this drug have uh, have some erectile dysfunction in few patients so how to do they need to take this uh, medication lifelong or they can you know manage like intermittent use for few months and then they can uh, resume and they can uh, off and off off and on like uh, phenomena for this particular drug well both uh, a couple of ways have been tried some have tried um, continuously for 6 months and then actually remove the alpha blocker and continued with the uh, finasteride or ditasteride if they do not develop uh, symptoms with a bothersome adverse effects adverse effects which are bothersome that means decrease libido if they haven't developed it then they would certainly continue on it if they have developed it and they are certainly bothered by it then they would need to be off it and then maybe an off and on could be a policy which could be tried or simply not have it if they are significantly bothered by it i have uh, two myths to be demolished i i sit in united states i don't actively practice but practically believe me every week i have a mail or a whatsapp message and that is a myth that there is so much of self investigation and self interpretation on prostate i have one statement is which you have very adequately answered that the statement that I, whether i have a prostate or not the conclusion of seeing a physician is that i have a prostate this is no information you don't have to even put a finger in the rectum as long as it has not been removed it is there second thing True. is first thing they do is whenever there is a symptom we they'll have after fifth decade first they go and get an ultrasound done and then ultrasound the myth begins from there it was 46.7 now it has become 49.2 and when is the dead limit i remove so i think you very adequately clear but this point it needs to be reemphasized prostate why we are doing all this pankaj has made very clear and gotham added to it that simply because surgery being simplified is not the answer it is not the best response to your disease or whatever symptoms you have and when people say because i have a patient who um, is dripping in continent and i was managing him conservatively and suddenly he saw somebody and he said i have a latest laser if you tell me now 3 o'clock you are at home so he right. said it's a very quick fix he got the laser done for a prostate which did not need anything and now whenever he comes here to meet me he is with the pad so the point we want to make is that surgery has its own price to be paid and however the expert the patient maybe there is no predictive model which will tell how one would behave after the prostatectomy this is a point i want to drive so that's why thanks to the drugs and the people who have been trained recently they are very conservative and according to me majority of the prostatic symptoms may not be eradicated but they could be controlled with drugs or the lifestyle changes again the point is the frequency of urine i don't think with all your sophisticated investment pankaj i would like to interact uh, frequency in a man at the age of 75 or 78 or nocturia can you definitely say why this frequency is except for median lobe can you wow and say that after prostatectomy his frequency would not be magnified more likely it not worst, it it is worst because a man coming uh, with both legs injured if you do amputation he'll be grateful to god that at least i have one limb so a man coming with retention would not complain to you about passing five times in the night but the man who has come for two times nocturia and after initial prostatic me passes 10 times he will go around telling that i have been worsened by the disease so the message to surgeons and this is old age frequency 
one can do several phds on that there are neurological factors there are bladder factors there are multiple factors so third myth i would like to say frequency done with only the prostatectomy indicated for only frequency is to be qualified that it may settle it may not settle and uh, the size you have already said and that's what my question on ultrasound was the size has no meaning for me i have seen 700 gram prostate with no residual patient passing well that doesn't become an indication to meddle with that natural anatomy at the same time you would agree that most of the small sclerous fibrous prostates are more obstructive so size is no indication you have made all these points but i'm trying to bring that and second thing is uh, i would like pankaj at the cost of repetition if you can elaborate how much one should be concerned about cancerous changes in prostate after the age of 70 and when right. would you separate that which is the real disease which needs attention or which is a disease which is a natural change because of the changing the epithelial metaplasia right so uh, to answer that there there are two portions to that as i said both diseases are actually age related so as we age more the prostate will develop benign prostate as well as more prostate cancer but how much of that prostate cancer is of any importance prostate cancer is normally a slower growing growing disease so if somebody is detected to have low grade or a lesser uh, prostate cancer at the age of 70 they are unlikely to be bothered by prostate cancer in their lifetime and should probably be looked at and followed however a uh, individual coming being uh, caught with prostate cancer earlier or a more aggressive kind which is easier now uh, by the various investigations that we have would then of course merit uh, treatment for that on the other now, hand stay there I, stay there i interrupt you even if you have a gleason 8 prostate cancer at 78 and if you have adequately treated how would you tell the, how much this person should worry so if it is already treated at 78 it is that patient that patient is not going to get bothered by prostate cancer mortality in that lifetime if it is already been treated exactly that's what i'm trying to say that it is no it is very different than other cancers it is if one Much has a choice good. i would like to have early prostate cancer than any other cancer because it is as good a disease which would rarely kill somebody yes you would be taken over by heart attack or some other natural non cancer specific mortality but so this is a very important point that just having the word cancer does not matter yeah you complete it i interrupted and i would like you to um, answer one more question for me the second part also is just as important is that some people who've had surgery for the benign prostate also ask that now are they still at risk for a prostate cancer so if somebody's had for some reason reason had prostate surgery for benign prostate at an earlier stage say late 50s or early 60s these individuals would still be at least looked for or screened for prostate cancer for at least one decade before they given a clean chit because the surgery for the benign prostate will still leave, still leave behind the rind or the shell where prostate cancer could still develop so the differentiation is at what age has the patient presented and so the same thing for a 70 70 75 year old unlikely if they have not found prostate cancer to the age of 70 75 that's not the disease that person should be bothering about for his lifetime the same question both of you gentlemen need to answer the the PSA before PSA we were people before PSA era when we practiced and life was much more comfortable only if we will pick up a disease which is a palpable gland you know and then yes, uh, at the most we'll do needle biopsy and put them but now PSA has created a lot of awareness in the in the urban and people who are educated 
it may be worth spending some time to tell that how do they interpret PSA both ways. You know, high PSA is indicator of prostate, but if there are prostatic symptoms, I have had patients with 110 PSA and fluctuating down to two. So if you can just clarify PSA indicators of a benign disease and malignant disease, and then also tell that one value of PSA has no value until you have periodicity or a gradient increase or velocity of PSA going up. So I think it may be worth, because I see a lot of educated people, people are from Philippines, people are from Egypt, Indonesia. So it would be good to really clarify that. Right. So, so PSA is a blood test which detects prostate specific antigen, which in most individuals will be less than 2.5 to 4, depending on what genetic population you're talking about. Um, and it will, uh, it, it's a marker for prostatic health, not only prostatic cancer. Um, prost PSA will rise in a variety of conditions. Uh, it will, of course, rise in prostate cancer. It will, however, also rise in very large prostate. It will rise after a patient has had a prostatic infection or if, the, if a large prostate has had an infarction of the prostate, the prostate PSA will rise. Or if uh, even after a catheterization, a, a PSA may be higher than normal. So it's a marker. It's like a flag, which you do not um, uh, let go of, but you don't live by it only. And more importantly, one has to see the trend of the PSA. So if somebody's had um, a PSA, which is, not only that, it also has to be taken in conjunction with the examination. So PSA will pick up only a fourth of prostate cancer and it'll still miss the, it may still miss the rest. So the examination of the rectal examination of the prostate is just as important. And the two of them together will probably catch the appropriate subset of people. Uh, prostate, the, the fluctuating PSAs will, are typically seen in patients who develop prostatitis or have very large glands with smoldering infections, because typically it does not tend to fall in, in prostate cancer. Um, as I said, it's to be seen in the complete picture rather than an isolated thing, because just looking at PSA will only cause PSA-itis, which is being totally involved with one's own PSA values beyond its worth. Uh, it has to be taken into account with the symptoms, the prostate examination, and if warranted further investigations to clarify why the PSA is high in any given individual. And imaging has been helpful to, to a large extent now with the MRIs uh, having shown us a bit more, and, but they're not to be done in all patients, not to be done uh, unnecessarily. They have to be tailored the word I think is tailored for every individual per se, rather than across the board. That's, that's yeah. my thought. Yeah, so my thought is, uh, you know, similar to uh, you both. And uh, my submission is the PSA is one thing which uh, alert us to evaluate completely. And we should look at the age and the comorbidity patient having. And then our aim should be which we are going toward that we should detect only clinically significant cancer. Otherwise, as you said, we need not to rush for the prostate cancer because uh, if we see the era and, and the literature what suggests that we should not rush. So we should uh, take many things together to decide which individual need the treatment and what treatment and which uh, individual even don't need any treatment, he can be uh, you know, watched uh, for uh, many years. So this is our aim to significant, uh, clinically significant detection of the clinically significant prostate cancer. So can okay. I, uh, yes, yeah, sir. Yeah, please go ahead. I, I will okay. go into so, some so, of the questions. So, yeah. yeah, one uh, myth is that uh, some individual comes that, uh, doctor, I am fit now. If you do surgery uh, on my prostate, then my risk of the prostate cancer would be uh, vanished. So as partially Dr. Pankas uh, uh, 
answered this question that the still the risk remain but uh, few uh, patient they asked that uh, if uh, uh, after doing the surgery for the benign that is the uh, benign prostate uh, risk of the prostate cancer will decrease or it will remain same or it will increase so what is your thought uh, dr vadwa on this well as i said uh, the risk for prostate cancer would remain same for that individual even if uh, benign prostate surgery has been done because we typically will leave behind the rind or the shell of the orange as i was talking and that's where cancers do tend to arise and therefore uh, if the age of the individual is such that um, they have a decade or two decades more of active life then they would be Uh, these would be people who would still need to be screened and kept on follow up um, for a potential prostate cancer development which would as i said be unchanged if you underwent a benign prostate surgery yeah thank you this is very big myth uh, which patient have that i underwent for surgery for the benign prostate so i don't have any risk of the prostate cancer no prostate cancer develop at different area of the prostate which we leave behind so thank you sir uh last Pankaj, to... i have some questions for you in the chat box can i please sir uh one is mr manikam somasundaram and he seems to be very concerned he has had a radical robotic prostatectomy in september and now he is doing i think obviously well psa is 0.00002 he is on kegels exercises and uh, he has a fistula which i think is unrelated he is not leaking any urine through that and uh, his incontinence has improved he is using one dry diaper uh, he has had it on 24th of september and they have done fistulogram and mri fistulogram and now all his question is that uh, he is a diabetic so should he get surgery done or not you know it's not related to us you can reassure him but uh, just because i don't want to discourage him he asked a question so so uh, i get he had a fistula in no he developed oh. a fistula in ano oh uh, okay right sorry a boil was there and looks like that there is a uh, but there it is not well, urinary fistula he doesn't right. leak so, you uh, i think that. it's, it's Right. It's completely unrelated uh, to his urinary symptoms. He 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 will probably do better with a good uh, fibrous diet, uh, avoid constipation, and uh, if he actually still has a fistula, which is bothersome, may even need it to be laid open or uh, see a, a the gastro surgeon. If it is uh, a low down fistula, it'll be laid open, or if it's a higher fistula, then a seton or something maybe need to be put. uh more importantly he has look at his diet a high roughage diet and um avoid constipation um i don't has anything with his uh, prostate sur- robotic prostate surgery um his obviously his psa at 45 days is uh, brilliantly low um biopsy of course would tell us more um his incontinence has reduced and with kegels exercise which he would have temporarily temporarily stopped because of the fistula you know will probably get resumed once the fistula you know is taken care of and uh, that is and his incontinence levels are likely to improve further with time all we wanted to reassure that according to me is that a spectacular outcome about his of his radical prostatectomy and his cancer seems to be under removed and his incontinence will improve and he is on a viagra to support him for erectile dysfunction so thank you uh there is one more question uh mm, i think uh, mr vikas vikas mehta vikas mehta yeah. yeah it's again uh, yeah you can just briefly address that so well my... the psa level is 15 uh, although 78 i'm sure he's he needs to be seen by a urologist before uh, any surgery is offered up front uh, so that at least there is a clear distinction or differentiation as to what the level what the reason for the high psa is whether it's infective 
uh, or not, whether the patient has been on a catheter. Um, as far as the need for surgery, I think as we've already said, just having 47 grams is not going to be the reason for him to undergo surgery. If he has significant um, problems which are not controlled with medication and if his flow or if he's on a catheter already, uh, that would be probably a reason for surgery. Uh, as far as what kind of surgery, um, a TURP or a laser, either of the two will be perfectly fine if surgery is already being contemplated by his treating uh, urologist. Um, for a 47.8 grams, even a TURP would probably be enough if surgery has already been uh, confirmed. I would like to inform the participant that Vertiguity Foundation has started a patient forum on the website. We are going to answer all these questions there and post these questions on the website. So please do visit our website. And if you have any questions related to this webinar or any other uh, question, we would be very happy to answer. You have the URL for this. Anything else? Gautam, back to you. So please, thank you. Yeah, thank you, sir. So my uh, 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 question to Dr. Vadava is that, uh, Suppose a patient uh, taken for the uh, TRP surgery for the benign prostate and in the biopsy report, uh, he diagnosed prostate cancer. Then how to uh, manage or what are the way to manage is, uh, please. Right, so um, a lot of things go into this. Um, how old is the patient? If the patient is above the age of 75 um, and has a lot of comorbidities, um, and what percentage of the biopsy of the tissue removed actually has um, the prostate cancer and what is the Gleason of the prostate cancer. Uh, there are a lot of variables which need to be factored in. So if it's less than 5% of the total tissue which uh, has, is, afflicted by prostate uh, is afflicted by prostate cancer and the Gleason is low grade, um, then this individual would probably need a re-evaluation about a month later um, because this is an incidentally detected prostate uh, cancer disease. And at that point in time, um, a re-baseline uh, PSA um, if uh, and uh, the extent of um, the disease locally uh, would have to be re-estimated. As I said, if this individual who's undergone this procedure is more than 75 years of age, does not have any and has a lot of comorbidities and there is no evidence of it being or missed having missed a, a, a locally advanced prostate cancer to start with, then probably just a wait and watch policy after, the, uh, after finding out his new baseline would be more than enough for that given individual. Um, conversely, if this is a young individual whose uh, Gleason is not so good, the percentage of prostate cancer in the tissue is more than 10%, and uh, at re-evaluation in a month's time, his PSA is still high and the MRI shows that there is still reasonable disease which was missed at the first instance, um, then this kind of this gentleman would probably need uh, a more evaluation of whether there is any uh, distant disease and may even be given a therapeutic option, whether it's radical surgery or uh, radiotherapy. So it will all, all depend on variables of the age of the individual, expected life expectancy, comorbidities, and the degree of disease actually there. So this is the, uh, thank you, sir. This is one way of the diagnosis and then we need to evaluate likely. So uh, next, uh, my question, which, uh, which is also a myth that uh, once surgery done for the benign prostate, then it's a lifelong cure or can it recur at after a few years? So um, a well done, prostate surgery should normally be a one-time job for that given individual. Um, the chances of the prostate to grow back would be at the same rate as it was earlier on. So if the individual had it really earlier on and was a large prostate to start with, uh, it would grow about 0.6 grams, um, a, a point, yeah, 0.4 to 0.6 grams a year. Um, so going by that standard, if somebody underwent surgery at the age of 65, then he's probably going to have a 20 gram prostate or 25 gram prostate at the age of 80, which is unlikely to be cause of any botheration. So again, size is not really the issue. Uh, if uh, everything else is factored in, the bladder is of good um, uh, power or is not underactive and the, there is not developed a stricture, 
there is re really no chance that this patient will have will be bothered by benign prostate in the future. Okay, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, well answered. Um, uh, next uh, myth is that, uh, <coughs> um, uh, like, uh, suppose one uh, uh, someone is very much concerned about the prostate and prostatic health. So, what he can do to uh, keep his prostate healthy, like, so disease, especially I talk about the, uh, you know, prostate cancer or enlargement of prostate, which give the symptoms he can avoid. Well, what are the way to keep you know prostate healthy in one prostate line? Prostate healthy is uh, when all that has to be done, uh, not at the age of 50, 60 plus, probably all that needs to be done at the age of 20, 30s, 40s. So they, they say that uh, the standard good Indian or Mediterranean diet is uh, lots of fresh fruits and vegetables, keeping active, staying healthy um, is probably the best what you can do for your prostate. More than that, uh, unlikely there's no specified diet otherwise so eating healthy a bit of everything fresh fruits and vegetables um, adequate fluid intakes um, and exercise remain remaining healthy are the only way one can uh, are all are the only things in one's domain to take care of uh, the rest is genetics and the and the third is aging which will come to most of us Okay, thank you. So uh, from my side, uh, almost all myths uh, have been cleared. So uh, if time permit, then we can discuss some medications and common, you know, interaction because at this is a point a patient usually often they are on medication for some other ailment like cardiac ailment, diabetic, glaucoma, uh, the cataract and all these. So uh, how to choose which drug and uh, is the switching is the option and like that we can discuss. True. So um, as I said, the mainstay usually for obstructive urinary complaints has been the alpha blockers for the longest time and they still continue to be so. Uh, however, they need to be tailored according to um, the sexual proclivity of the individual and how much they would be bothered by retrograde ejaculation. There would be some set of drugs which be more specific and have lesser chance of retrograde ejaculation. So they would, those would be preferable for the younger male with the urinary symptoms related to the prostate versus a, a much older individual who is less bothered by the fact of retrograde ejaculation. Um, similarly, the sexual appetite or the libido would also um, be a thing to factor in uh, whether choosing um, anti-androgens or not. Regarding comorbidities, um, a lot of people would be on uh, antihypertensives and therefore they must be cautioned about uh, postural hypertension and whether or not they, it, it could potentially accentuate the postural hypertension in some individuals, especially if they have low ejection fractions to start with. Um, so therefore, uh, maybe a dose titration and uh, a gradual uh, and, uh, and a monitored approach would be appropriate in such people. These are also the individuals who, uh, if they have bothersome symptoms and are unable to tolerate the medication, would then be become uh, candidates for undergoing surgery for the sheer fact that they are actually more bothered by the symptoms of the adverse effects rather than the therapeutics of the medication itself. Um, and so there'll be a very small subset of patients who would actually need surgery for the prostate because they can't tolerate the side effect of the medication which is needed to alleviate their symptoms. Um, similarly, patients who have Parkinsonism, uh, they are a difficult to subset of people because they have a lot of things going on. They're on a lot of medication. Their urinary symptoms are largely derived from their um, uh, medication as well as the disease itself. However, there will be a very small subset which has to be very carefully pre-selected uh, who have the prostate as an additional actual problem in their flow and only uh, very conservatively surgery is performed on them uh, so as not to lead to more discomfort in their symptoms than what they are actually uh, what they have actually presented with. So um, as far as um, comorbidities are concerned, I think these are, are, are important. 
Similarly, for patients who are on uh, anti-diabetes medication, and there are a variety of them now possible uh, available, there are medications which reduce blood sugar by actually increasing blood urinary sugar. And now if these individuals were having more urinary infections in association with their prostate, so either their drug of the sugar needs to be modified so as to not have glycosuria uh, versus um, changing the medication or even not, or maybe offering them up surgery if they still need uh, the medication for the diabetes. So I think there are more than one things which uh, are at play and, and it's important for the physician as well as the urologist to work in tandem in, in such sub, sub, subset of patients. Thank you, sir. So one question from uh, Mr. Jagarnath Dixit. He's asking that uh, diverticula of the bladder uh, with the benign prostate. So how to follow? Like he wants to, to know the treatment options for this condition. Right. So again, that's a um, trickier situation. It all depends how large the diverticula is. Um, whether there is any information of it being there earlier on uh, and its worsening of size and how much is obstructive component. So this is a patient who would need a urodynamics and uh, more imaging in forms of uh, uh, video urodynamics to see how the emptying of the diverticula is, how the emptying of the bladder is because their pressures may be falsely low because of the large diverticulum. So if it's a small diverticulum and they have symptoms and it's the prostate, which is probably the problem. While if it's a very large diverticulum with apparently low pressures, the prayer problem may actually be the diverticulum, which may have to be dealt with first. And then the prostate looked at again uh, so it all depends on how large the diverticulum is and whether it's a primary diverticulum which has increased rapidly over say four or five years because of the prostate having increased in size which led to more symptoms and we've had patients whom we've actually done just a diverticulectomy and not touch the prostate and they've actually become fine and or they've been managed with just alpha blockers. Conversely we've had the reverse also where uh, we've not touched the diverticulum because it was emptying reasonably well and we've just dealt with the prostate with medication slash surgery. So um, these are, these need more tailoring uh, and a bit, spending a bit more time with these patients and a bit more investigations to give them the best outcome. Thank you, sir. So if you go with the theory, then this patient uh, having the upper tract changes, he need the, sorry, uh, secondary changes, he need the surgery, but as you mentioned, uh, he need thorough investigation and evaluation, then we can answer uh, his question. So thank you. Next question uh, from Sedu Bharat is, any relation between COVID and the prostate cancer? Well, I don't think we've had COVID long enough to do it because prostate cancer is a slow disease. So I, I don't think we have, we, we'll have data for that maybe 10, 15 years from now. Um, but it's far too early to have any kind of association between COVID as a disease and prostate cancer. Uh, currently, there is no association between the two. It's far too little time spent with COVID, luckily. Yeah, thank you, sir. So COVID, the informations are yet not mature to say. Yes, uh, next question is uh, uh, from Domai Kino Ziar De La Rosa. Uh, he is 50 year old and taking tamsulosin for urethra restrictive operation in 2017. So he's asking, do biking is good exercise for me? Biking is good exercise for everybody. Um, I, I don't think it has direct relationship to the prostate. However, if you're too avid at biker doing a, doing a lot of that, you may develop uh, urinary constrictive disease if you've had a fall of your bike, but unlikely to actually, if you've not um, had an unpleasant experience while biking, you're unlikely to be bothered by uh, your biking uh, and your urinary symptoms. And you, if you need, the, need to use um, alpha blockers, then they need to, con they, he probably needs to continue them if they are helping. Okay, and last myth from my side that a uh, few patient comes that uh, doctor that treatment uh, medications are quite expensive and I need to take uh, uh, lifelong so they are you know uh, very expensive. Uh, please uh, do surgery on me uh, so that I will you know get rid of the medications. So 
what is your opinion on uh, this question well again this is a a very gray area um, but it's not an uh, it's not something which we don't come across so if the person has moderate symptoms and um, yet is on the borderline for not having actually achieved a actual need for surgery yet is and is also benefited by medication yet is unable to afford them then it would be a middle path with 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 uh, understanding the side effects of any surgery uh, but it would not be terrible to offer this gentleman surgery if he has improved with alpha blockers and cannot afford to have them longer so yes um, this would be a small very very small subset but not a non existent subset of patients who would probably still end up having surgery because they would like to avoid the medication uh, as i said they would need to understand it's only the obstructive complaints or the poor flow rates which will get better if their primary complaint has been urinary frequency as Dr. professor bandari had alluded to early they are unlikely to be helped even with the surgery and therefore um, choosing very carefully and counseling i think would be just as important so thank you sir uh, nicely uh, you know covered by you not only prostate and uh, secondary urinary symptoms you covered in total all factors which can affect the voiding uh, so now we uh, from my side uh, one question someone asked sneha is it necessary to apply covid vaccine so it is not i think related to us uh, so we are not expert to but answer but you still answer but it is very should, but you should yeah you yes, must sir. that this is a platform we should use to say don't okay. get into myths and politics for you the last must have a, for the last six months, for, i for think three of us have had vaccines isn't it i have my both yes. doses you vaccinated both have had it, and we are absolutely fine so you must have a vaccine there's no alternative six months people have been asking for it now it's there and people are having thoughts i don't understand it so if you get the chance then you should go for it you must go get for. it as early as possible thank you sir dave your back to you well yes. gentlemen thank you so much it was this is the longest webinar we've had there were so many questions that you know you can see that there's a lot of people that really wanted to learn from you today but Dr. Wadwa, Dr. Chowdhury, thank you so much for being with us today.